the theme of healing is fascinating because it is so multi-layered and multi-dimensional because the human being itself is multi-layered and multi-dimensional modern medicine has taken a very superficial approach necessary perhaps to its objectivity need for objectivity but still superficial because it bases itself on a limited material perspective of who we are it starts with the assumption that we are this collection of cells which somehow by some machinery is able to reproduce itself and that's the characteristic of life the yogic approach goes much deeper it sees things inside out this morning we briefly spoke of the fact that we have five bodies the lower three are what we are <coughs> we live in mostly consciously but just these three bodies interacting produces such a complex interplay because the three bodies are made of completely different substance each having completely different properties so the material substance has predominantly the character of inertia and therefore in matter you can repeat certain things as we say in physics two billiard balls bang against each other they will bounce in exactly these angles with this velocity etc and you can repeat that 20 times you will get the same results because of the character of inertia it continues doing the same thing in the same groove in the same manner but the moment you move to the life energy the vital body it does not have inertia and there the laws change you cannot replicate the same experiment 20 times and get the same result because life energy is constantly changing <coughs> life energy has its own laws unlike the physical body which has a tendency to degenerate to wear out as all matter has life energy is essentially mortal and it is it's it is of the nature of pure force it is pushing it is in movement it doesn't stay static you can't keep life energy static unless you put it in a whirl and so it seems like it's static i've packed it inside a cell i have cellular energy i've packed the sunlight into a cell but internally there is a whirl of energy you cannot stop it you cannot control it with the kind of precision with which you can control matter because it is innately of a different character and it has its responses are also much more uh, expressive of what we have and what we experience as emotions life energy does not have the sense, same sense of space and distance as matter has so life energy can act at a greater distance it is more fluid and so you can make it do things which you couldn't make matter do so just the interplay between matter and life energy creates a huge possibility of flexibilities and variations bring in mind and mind has a completely different character it is self aware it can choose you cannot replicate experiments the way you do with physics when you talk to a human being he will give the first a reply you ask him a second time he will give the same reply perhaps but slightly irritated a third time and he will not give you the same reply he'll say why are you asking me again and again <laughs> because innately being conscious its responses are different it responds in awareness to circumstances and like the billiard balls of balls of matter and mind is even more flexible more fluid and free than matter and life force so mind for example can not only transcend distance easily but it can also see across time so for example you can push life energy from here to there but it hits you when you send it but mind can act on the future or even on the or perceive the past 
So you bring that in now in, as a third factor and the interplay between mind and life, life and matter and mind and matter creates a huge complex mix. That's what the human being is more like. And into that you introduce the spiritual component, the soul, the action of a higher consciousness, of the divine grace. And then it becomes enormously complex, unpredictable. And that's when it gets most interesting. So I'll begin with an example of something which uh, boggles the understanding of conventional medicine. It took place in the ashram in the, I believe in the 50s or 60s, very early on. And we had a doctor who was a homeopath. His name was Dr. Ram Chandar. And he used to have remarkable results. In the French consulate, a Frenchman was dying. All the doctor's efforts had failed. He was on his deathbed. The priest had been called to do the prayers so that he has a safe transition. And then someone in the family said, you know what, there's this Dr. Ram Chandar, he's very famous. He seems to have a, something special, why don't we just try him? So they called Dr. Ram Chandar, he comes to this man on the deathbed, looks at him, asks a few questions. Then from his pouch, he pulls out a homeopathic medicine, opens his mouth and puts it in, closes and then tells the family, in one hour either he will die or he will get back to life. And he walks out. <laughs> <laughs> and an hour later, this man who is so sick and dying opens his eyes, gets up in his bed, is completely cured. And then the allopaths come and say, oh, but you must rest, you must rest. The family says, no, we don't trust you. We believe this Dr. Ramachandar. <laughs> and Ramachandar says, no, you don't trust. Get up and start your work, start your routine, you're fine, no problem. And this sent shock waves, of course, especially among the conventional medicine men, Nirod Bharan being among them. And then there was a whole series of correspondence between him and uh, Sri Aurobindo. And Nirod Bharan says something like, well, how can this be? This is miraculous. And if the, the homeopathy is so effective, I should abandon allopathy. And Sri Aurobindo says, well, it's not like that. You know, each system has its own advantages. There's a whole lot of interesting discussion that emerges. Now, in conventional allopathic terms, homeopathy is simply this sugar pill with water. And there's nothing else to it in molecular terms. But, and so they can't explain it. They have to dismiss it even without attempting to test it. My experience with homeopathy was interesting. I used to have a lump of fat on my forehead, the lipoma they call it. It was a cosmetic issue. I said, okay, forget it. And then after some time, someone said, why don't you try homeopathy? So I went to this person in Pondicherry and uh, he was a devotee from Orissa. He gave me something, I took it, within an hour I had a severe headache. The most severe headache I have ever had in my entire life. I can't remember one which was more painful and I had quite a few before that. And this lasted three full days, at the end of which I had a major meeting, some senior VIP was coming, I had to attend to him, I couldn't survive with that headache. I went back to this doctor and I said, you know what, I have this severe headache since I took that medicine. He says, and I said, I need to have it out because I need to function normally. He said, no problem. He pulls out another medicine, homeopathy, remember, sugar pill, gives it to me, I take it, the headache vanishes. Didn't come back. And that got me thinking, here's a sugar pill that can create a headache at will and remove it at will. There has to be something to this homeopathy thing. So that's when I began to read about it and experiment with it. But you know, the understanding of it is, uh, is also interesting if you look at it from the yogic point of view. You know how homeopathic medicine is made. You take a medicine which, or you take a, a poison which creates a certain illness. If I take this poison, it's going to create a series of symptoms of fever, uh, vomiting and etc. So you know the effects that the poison has. Now you take that poison, take a drop of it in a thousand drops of plain water, shake to dilute. And then you take one drop of that, one thousandth diluted and mix it in a thousand drops of water, shake to dilute and keep diluting. Eventually the number of dilutions is such that not one molecule of the original poison will remain. 
But homeopathy says each time you do this dilution and shaking, you are increasing the potency of the medicine. Whereas by conventional uh, allopathic thinking, it's you are reducing the effectivity. But interestingly, this now potentized sugar, pill and water will cure exactly the symptoms which the poison would have created. So if somebody has this pattern of fever and vomiting etc which the poison would create, take this homeopathic pill, potentized water and it will cure it completely. Interesting isn't it? Like treats like. It sounds strange. And Sri Aurobindo has an interesting comment in his correspondence with Nirod Bharan. He says, homeopathy is a science. Allopathy is not a science. Allopathy is empirical. That means in allopathy you keep experimenting. Try this, it works. Try that, it doesn't work. You don't have a science. Whereas homeopathy is a science because it starts with a procedure which tells you exactly what result a medicine will have. So certainly it's superior, isn't it? You would agree with me. So, it's very interesting to observe Sri Aurobindo's comments on these things. But he says, of course, each has its limitations. Now, let us understand it from a yogic point of view. If every object, let's take the plant chemical or the plant substance which created, which had that poisonous effect. Every object has these three layers. A physical component, a vital component and a mental component. Every object. The mental component may be weak may not be able to express itself through the life energy or through the material organization. You take a stone and the stone has a mental component which holds the form of the stone. The idea of stone is behind it. But the stone does not have flexibility in order to be able to express itself the way let's say the flower can or the insect can or the human can. We have a complex biology highly sensitive, which, can, which is moldable and therefore our thoughts can shape themselves and force their way through and we can speak. But if somehow your jaws were locked and your throat vocal cords were uh, frozen, you wouldn't be able to speak. And if your entire nervous system was dulled, someone would say you're dead because you can't communicate. But your mind would still be active as happens in the case of people who are uh, so-called vegetal where there is a brain damage and the person is completely paralyzed, they can't speak. Sometimes after 30 years they come out of the coma and they say we could hear everything normally but we couldn't speak. The whole nervous system was frozen, that's all. A stone also has a lot to say if you could tap into its mental or life consciousness. In fact, a sensitive person can hold a coin or a stone and describe who has used it, what it has gone through, at least in terms of significant experiences. Because the imprint is still carried, but there is no way for it to articulate itself. Okay, so now if you look at an object in terms of these three levels, the plant which I tested as a poison, which now becomes medicine after dilution, that plant has a physical, vital and mental component. When I go through the process of so-called dilution in water, the shaking process, I am removing the physical layers, but the vital layer continues, the mental layer continues, and through that shaking process can even get amplified. Its effectivity on the vital and mental level is more, effectively on the physical level is being removed. The result is the poisonous side effect is out, and the life force effect remains, that's what's affecting you. So in terms of, uh, from a yogic perspective, the homeopathic medicine is affecting you much more at the level of life force and mind than at the purely chemical uh, molecular level of the body. And this is the reason why for certain types of illnesses homeopathy is more effective, especially things which have to do with life energy imbalances and mind. And in fact some of the symptoms of homeopathy are psychological. If you have certain kinds of dreams then these are the medicines for you. It's interesting. Uh, also, when you potentize, the effect is much more on the mind than on the vital or the physical. So depending on the nature of your problem, you will decide what potency of medicine to give. If you have problems of intense worry, which lead to stomach ache, but the worry component is stronger than the stomach ache component, then we would give a high dosage, high potency dosage, 
Whereas the worry component is weaker and the stomach component is stronger, we would give a low potency which is closer to the physical. When you think in these terms, the whole science of homeopathy makes a whole lot of sense. Right? So what we're seeing here is a rich possibility of approaches to medicine. And I'm deliberately using approaches. There are many others also. We have heard of uh, acupuncture, acupressure, and uh, I don't know how many, Ayurveda and uh, Siddha medicine, uh, naturopathy. You can make a whole range of them. Of late, there are even some weird types of uh, treatments which people come up with. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And each, Sri Aurobindo says, each system catches one line of nature's working and builds the whole thing around it. But you could have a larger, more comprehensive view and you could see all these and their, each of their strengths and limitations. So this is as far as the physical, medicinal approach to curing is concerned. But I'm more interested in the things which follow after which are of a different type. I have, in the title, I've mentioned physical healing, uh, occult and spiritual. And these are the areas which I want to touch upon much more and see their connection with the physical. Deepak Chopra has a very interesting incident he narrates in his book, uh, where he says that there was this a patient who had a terminal form of illness. Doctors had tried everything, everything had failed. As a last resort, because he's terminal, he's been given only a week to live, the doctor tells him, you know what, there's a medicine that has shown some promise, it's under trial, if you like, we can try it on you. So the guy says, well, you've given me a week, I might as well try it. So he's given this medicine still under test, and within three days, there's a dramatic recovery. This man who was completely bedridden gets out of bed and is walking along in the corridor, greeting other patients, you see a steady recovery. And after a week or two, the doctor comes back to him and says, you know what, the medicine was under trial and the trials have completely failed. But in your case, it has worked, so let's just continue with it. From the next day, the decline began. A week later, he was back on the bed and he died soon after. There's another incident of, uh, in the ashram somebody was diagnosed as having only one functional lung. So the doctor, this time he was careful, being in the ashram, he had a deeper understanding of things, fortunately. He approached the mother rather than telling the patient, mother, this is what I found. From childhood, the fellow had some problem always of breathing and the doctor came to this diagnosis, he informed the mother. Mother said, whatever happens, don't tell him. <laughs> and the fellow lived a long life reasonably healthy. There's another case of uh, somebody, astrologer had said that so and so person will die within 15 days. So the family reported to the mother and mother said, go and tell everybody that this is the prediction. <laughs> and of course nothing happened. So there are th dimensions to that which I won't touch now, but the idea that if a person believes in a medicine, it has a result. And if he believes it doesn't work, it has a different result. This now comes into the play. And this becomes increasingly important because we find in modern medicine, there is a mechanism of self-evaluation. There's a mechanism of testing that every medicine goes through. Every company comes out with the medicine. We've gone through so many tests and trials conducted. These are the results. These are the dangers, etc. The problem is, after the medicine is out there in the market, if somebody else attempts to replicate those tests, we find that less than 50% of the medicines are found to be effective in the way they are sold for. Well, this is scary. This is scary. And yet, they are out there, they seem to be working. But you cannot replicate those tests which a company has done, you're just not unable to replicate them in most cases. Very few medicines which are extremely strong have specific results, but beyond that. On the other hand, we find there's a whole series of uh, experiments in what they call the placebo effect, where a person is given sugar pills and told this is effective medicine and it has the effect. And science is unable to explain this. But from the yogic perspective, the 
solution is very simple, very obvious, and this is what we will find most interesting for our own utility. <coughs> In the correspondence with Nirod Baran, emerging from Dr. Uh, R's magical cure, Sri Aurobindo explains that there are three things. There is the force, there is the instrument, and there is the instrumentation. All three are important. We find in Dr. Ramchandar's correspondence with Sri Aurobindo a clue of how this works. So Dr. Ramchandar used to write to Sri Aurobindo regularly. He would write, for example, it's not exactly what he wrote, but something along these lines. This morning I met so-and-so patient. I diagnosed this. I gave him such and such medicine and prayed for your help and felt your force at 10.35 a.m. Another time, so there are a series of letters of this kind. What medicine is given, he has prayed, he has felt the help from Sri Aurobindo. <coughs> Another time he has written, this afternoon I gave medicine to so and so, I prayed and I received your force, but he has not written the time. And in the margin Sri Aurobindo writes 2.35 p.m. <laughs> no, I don't have the exact timings, but this is what it, the content of the letter is. So what you are seeing here is, he prays, Sri Aurobindo receives the prayer, the call and sends his response. The doctor is conscious, Sri Aurobindo is conscious and of course that force acts through the instrument that is the doctor and the instrumentation that is the medicine. Now all three should ideally be aligned. If the force is there, the right medicine is there but the doctor is not so clear. The doctor says, mm, I'm not sure if this will help you. Let's try if it will work. Come back to me after a week and tell me if it worked or not. You can see the effect it will have on you. And then there are doctors who come. Oh, what's the problem? This is nothing. We'll get rid of it in two hours. Take this right now. Wow. You've had that experience with doctors? Yeah. He walks into the room and your energy goes up. Boom. Half your fever is gone just by his presence. I've seen people sometimes bedridden, they're like that, they can't open their eyes, they can't speak. The doctor comes, they get up, they're full of energy. The doctor goes and then they go back to their sleep. But where did that energy come from? The doctor, his vitality, the punch that he brings, the conviction that he carries, transmits to you. Now there's a transmission of life force taking place Transmission of his conviction that's coming into you and that leaves a deep imprint. It stays with you even after the doctor is gone. And this is the reason why you can look at a doctor and say how effective he will be. And patients have a natural feel and they will say, you will say things like, that doctor he is good, the other doctor is not so good. Why? If you try to now feel who who's the one that you trust more, you will see it has something to do with this enormous energy, vitality, optimism, positive vibes that he puts out. He brings confidence. What is confidence? Conviction. Conviction, another word is faith. He gives you the faith that you'll get well. And then there's the third component which is the instrumentation, the medicine itself, which is the vehicle which actually transmits. And there's a difference also there when things are given. Udarda narrated an incident once. He used to have a chronic ear pain. And uh, he was told by somebody, there's so and so fellow who is a uh, tantric, who cures people, he's very effective. So with mother's permission, Udarda went to that man. The fellow took some vibhuti, sacred ash, and pushed it in his ear, pushed it until it was paining, and said, okay, now you'll be cured. Udada came back from that trip, still worried, still in doubt. And he said within a few days, almost all the problem vanished, just a little bit remained. And he went to the mother and told the mother that it was very effective, but still something tiny bit remained <coughs> of the problem. Mother said that's because you didn't have faith. 
I'm going to give you another example. This was told to us by Ravindra Ji. He was in charge of the ashram fruit room. And you know, Mother was doing a lot of experiments with people. This is not really in the domain of uh, medicine, but still, it's, there's something common. So Ravindra Ji was uh, in charge of the fruit room. In those days, we didn't have air conditioning for the fruits. So you had to use up the fruits quickly. And one day, a huge stock of oranges came. And uh, the mother told Ravindra Ji, fine, all these oranges you keep aside in one place. And every day you give me juice of two oranges. Ravindra Ji said, no way that's going to work. Because the oranges will spoil. I can't use up so many. If I'm giving you two a day, this is going to last a few months. They'll get spoiled. And mother said, don't question, just do what I'm saying. He said, okay. He goes back, he's kept all these oranges. He said, the next day, half the oranges spoiled. <laughs> but he did as mother said, he gave her two. The second day, there were none that had spoiled. He gave her two. The third day, none had spoiled. And he said, for the next few months, it continued, not one orange spoiled. It was amazing. So obviously, mother had done something, she had put some force, he was still the agent for that through whom she applied that force and his doubt had come in the way that said the first lot, the first day had this negative result but after that something cut through and after that he was an instrument for keeping those things intact. They didn't spoil at all for months. And so the, the element of the person who is the vehicle for the force is important, but the thing which you give also serves a purpose. If you give wrong medicine, of course, it will have a negative effect. You need to give something which corresponds to the action required on a material level. But you see now, things are operating on several levels. The force that's coming in is operating at the level of the consciousness which is most receptive to the force. The person who is the intermediary his vitality, his conviction, what he transmits is another component operating at the level of your energies, your convictions, especially your vital. And then the medicine instrumentation is working at the level of the physical and through the physical on other levels also. Okay? Now if all three could be aligned, you might have miraculous results. And generally that's what tends to happen. In uh, this question of the conviction transmitted, the faith. Sri Aurobindo has a lot to say. And we find some extraordinary experiments, uh, exper extraordinary results in modern medicine also. We find, for example, under hypnosis, that we are able to extend certain dramatic cures which otherwise have no other explanation. A person, for example, could be given under deep hypnosis, a person could be told, here is an apple. Do you see the apple? He sees it under hypnosis. We don't, but he sees it. So I say, here's the apple and I give it to him. He receives the apple. He can feel it. He can scratch it, smell it, taste it, bite into it and chew it. He can eat the entire apple, which is empty air here, and he will feel full. You will not feel hungry after that. And you can have him eat food for days together like this and he will still look healthy. Isn't that remarkable? How is that working on a biological level? I gave the example this morning of a person who's told that in my hand is burning incense and you touch him and the scaled mark forms. The body has recognized, accepted that it's been burnt and it starts the process. First of all, it shows the symptoms of burn, the skin becomes black and it starts the process of healing. An order operating at the level of the mind's understanding is affecting the molecular and cellular working of the body. How is that possible? I'll give another example. Under anesthesia, which is not too different from deep hypnosis, interestingly. You can also leave behind similarly suggestions. So this is an experiment done where people were told under anesthesia while the surgery was on, the doctors were asked to make comments. 
casual, flippant comments like, Oh, this patient, his problem is really bad. He will take weeks to get well. On a matter which was actually very simple. And other cases where the matter was complicated, where they expected problems, the doctors were asked to make comments like, Oh, this person, he'll get well within a few days. No problem at all. And the result, what they found was, there was a direct correlation between the comments and the healing. Where the doctors made comments like, he'll get well quickly, the person got well quickly. The, where they made comments like, there'll be problems, there were actually complications which followed. It's like a post-hypnotic suggestion, where the whole healing system of the body was now responding to these casual comments. Now imagine how many surgeries are taking place out there, where doctor make, doctors make all kinds of jokes about the patients. And the effect that will have on the patient. Consider even the thoughts of the doctors, because under hypnosis, even the thoughts have an effect. They found, for example, in the US, more than 10% of the population under hypnosis would accept that they had been uh, abducted by UFOs and would describe in vivid detail all the classic symptoms of abduction. The only problem was the results depended on who the hypnotist was. When the hypnotist wanted to hear stories of abduction, you got those stories. When, he didn't, when the hypnotist himself didn't believe that it had happened, you didn't get those stories. In other words, the hypnotist's expectations reflected in the person's memories. You could evoke false memories simply by wanting them under hypnosis. So what you see is under hypnosis, there's a kind of a deep connection that forms in the consciousness where your intentions and your states as a doctor get transmitted, imprinted in the patient and emerge as results, long-term results sometimes. Now it gets really interesting because you see how uh, deeply these things can act, which otherwise to us seem so superficial. Now you see we have moved out from the domain of getting right medicine for right illness and we have suddenly come into the domain of psychological states, expectations, fears and faith. When the body believes it has been burnt, it starts the whole process of creating the burn mark and the healing process. Where did the belief come into the body? When the person tells me, and I'm the patient now, I'm under hypnosis, he tells me this is burning incense. It's gone in my mind, from my mind into my life energies and into the life energy processes. And when the burn takes place, I feel the heat. It's operating at the cellular level and molecular level. <coughs> through the mind, of course, through the life energies into the biological process itself. Now this means there's a continuity of mental content, mental awareness, all the way to the cells, of life energy, of course, all the way to the cells. And they are responsive to all those things. If, while giving medicine, I hold in my mind a doubt, and I give the medicine with doubt, it will have less effect. When I give the medicine with a strong conviction, it will have a greater effect. Right? On the other hand, the patient's side, the doctor may give with conviction, but I go with doubt. Is this doctor reliable? Is this system reliable? Is the first time I'm going to a homeopath? Does it work really? My doubt can neutralize the doctor's conviction. Right? I may still have a result, but it will be diluted. So ideally, you need this alignment of conviction between both doctor and patient. If behind that there's the huge mass of conviction in the collective consciousness, that's even more useful. There's a system, remember? And the system tells you that this is good and that is bad. And that's the collective faith in society, of which the doctor now becomes a representative and pushes into the patient. So I'll give you a few examples of this. There's a very famous uh, classic uh, case of a tribe of uh, people in South America, way down south, where it's extremely cold, snow, and these people used to live without clothes. When the first <coughs> Europeans arrived there, 
with their conventional understanding of uh, medicine, they said to this tribe, this is not good. You will catch pneumonia if you don't wear proper clothes. And the tribe said, oh, is that true? We didn't know that. Thank you for telling us. And they began to put on clothes to protect themselves from the cold. And very quickly, they all caught pneumonia and the entire tribe was wiped out. The entire tribe was wiped out. The collective belief coming upon them like this crushed their own innate conviction. Similarly, you will see in today's uh, television ads which sell cough syrup. And they start with a scene where this child is playing in the rain, he gets wet, and mom says, don't play in the rain, and the child comes and sneezes. And children seeing that ad get programmed. And parents repeat the same story, don't get wet, you will catch a cold. Don't do this, you will get that. And that is a conviction, a negative conviction, a negative faith that's being imprinted, leading to the illness precisely which you are taught you should have or rather the body is taught it should have. And it's like a post-hypnotic suggestion. So the same post-hypnotic suggestion which would create a positive correction can also be used to create a negative illness. And we can wonder how many of the modern illnesses are really the product of a collective belief. In the ashram, I had heard stories from some of the old sadhaks. They said things like, in those days we had very little food. By current standards, it was not nutritious at all, but we never fell ill. Much later, we had all these people who came with uh, their nutritional expertise, who said, this is not enough, that's not enough, you must have that. And that's when we learned that we have so many problems. In the early days, the ashram dispensary had very few medicines. Mostly there was something called red medicine, which was given to everybody practically for anything. <laughs> And then somebody came and said that this doesn't work. And the mother had to tell the doctor, okay, start giving conventional medicine now because the faith is not uh, there anymore. And now you see a huge complex set of medicines and all kinds of special tools. I remember in, uh, when I was small, the maid in the house used to complain that she had a bit of a cold, she went to the general hospital and she came back very dissatisfied. That doctor is no good. We asked why. He does not give an injection. <laughs> and it became a serious problem when the doctors discovered that the patients wouldn't come to them because they didn't trust them because they didn't give injections. And so they began to give saline injections. Anybody who came had to have a saline injection. And these patients went back happy and they said, okay, now we'll get cured. <laughs> and of course it would have a result, I'm sure. So we, have, we see here a very uh, different perspective. There is a collective faith, both positive and negative. The collective faith may say, these things will protect me, these things will cure me. The negative faith will say, those things will make me sick. And because we believe in it collectively, we pull ourselves and our children and the whole society into those results. Sri Aurobindo has some very interesting uh, observations in his thoughts and aphorisms on this business of medicine. I wish I had the exact text. But he actually compares the so-called witch doctor of the tribes with modern medicine men. And they're not too different. The witch doctor, you see, he gives, he repeats some mambo jumbo give some medicine, hits you with a few sticks, and you get cured. Mm -hmm. The modern doctor, he puts a stethoscope on your chest, drops a few pills in your mouth, you get cured. It's not very different, really. It's just, you believe in the system, they believe in that system, and you get the results that you believe in. And so that brings us now to the third level of uh, understanding. Behind all these, is a conviction, belief, faith. And I will play on to this word faith a little bit. And the force behind, which is the primary force of which all other forces are secondary and tertiary forces. And when we look at these two things, we go at the essence, the heart of all healing, cure, medicine, etc. 
So first let's look at what this business of faith is. And faith as a word in English is a little clouded. It's not a precise enough word. It blurs with the other word called belief. So when you say belief and you say faith, there's a huge overlap. You must have faith that whatever it is the religion tells you to do or the doctor tells you to believe in. But that's a belief that has been taught to you. But the deeper sense of faith in the spiritual sense is, would be the Sanskrit word Shraddha. Shraddha we translate as faith but it's something more profound or the true sense of the word faith as it should have been. Shrat and Dha, these are the two root sounds in Sanskrit. Shrat is the essential truth. And Dha is holding, containing, clinging to. So holding, containing, clinging to the essential truth, that's Shrat Dha, faith. Sri Aurobindo describes it thus, faith he says is the knowledge of the soul. It is an innate knowing where you already know. So let me give an example. Uh, do you believe that you exist? Okay. Do you believe that the sun will rise tomorrow? Yeah, of course. How? Tell me. Can you prove it to me? Yeah, but that's physics, you know. Your belief rests on something external to you. Do you believe that uh, this plane will fly? Oh yeah, there's a whole aeronautic science behind it which will make sure that it flies. But when I ask you, do you believe you exist? It's not really belief. I know I exist. <coughs> Prove it to me. Or how do you know it's the, you're not uh, deceiving yourself? I don't need any proof. I know because I am my existence. You see the difference? It is an innate knowing. You are the knowing itself as distinct from leaning on some belief of things outside you. This innate knowing where you are the thing itself is what we call faith. So do you, do you know you exist? Yes, of course I, I know. <coughs> do you know you're healthy? When you're sick, do you know you'll get well? If you know you won't get well, you won't. If you know you will get well, it's a question of time. I can assist the process, I can speed up the process, but you will get well, because you know you will get well. You see where we are going with this. There used to be, now I don't remember in which family it was, but there was a very famous astrologer who looking at his chart had calculated the date of his death. And on that day, as predicted, he said goodbye to everybody, lay down and died. He knew he was going to die on that day. You see? If he had chosen to break that conviction and chosen to know that he is greater than his chart and his fate, that conviction, that knowing would have overridden all other influences. Now you understand why the mother said not to tell the person that he had only one functional lung. Because if the person now knew that he was sick and accepted that, he would actually get worse. Right now he knew he was well. He would continue well. So this principle of the faith is something extremely important. And the source of all faith is deep within us. And there are layers sometimes in that. So there's a faith of the body. The body knows it will get well. When you lean over a tall building, the body shrinks. It knows it will get hurt. Okay, your mind may want to jump from a height. You try to force your body to move, but somehow the body does not respond to you anymore. Like when you have to jump from a height into water. You see children, they lean forward and the body bends. <laughs> they can't control themselves. The body does it. And it takes a huge amount of willpower and force to compel the body to move forward. Even then, when they can't do it, you need someone to push them once. They fall into the water, they come back, now they can move the body. Because the body now knows it won't get hurt, it's safe enough. 
You see how it works. The innate belief of the body is different from what the mind wants to do. And it can override everything else. And a similar thing exists in the body itself at an organic level, even at a cellular level. I briefly touched upon it this morning when I said the mother had worked on the cells and discovered that they are innately immortal, but they have a habit of dying, habit of aging and dying. And she traced it back to the earliest period of life, when life was trying to organize itself in matter, it had to push forward against the resistance of matter and repeatedly it failed and failed and failed and failed until it got the habit, the memory of millions of years of struggle to assert and to fail remained in it imprinted so that now the cells grow and then as, as if the habit kicks in, oh yeah, now it's time to fail, we need to age and shut down and die. It moves in that direction. And she said, I had to work on the cells to awaken a deeper faith. Now the cells don't have it. You have to go deeper. And what do you go to? You can find the faith in the life force, the faith in the mind. But then deep behind it all, there is the faith of the soul, the psychic being, the divine presence in us. And if you can bring its faith and imprint that into the mind, into the life, into the body. It can override those, change those, but there may be a clash of faiths as a first step. Which faith is more profound? Which faith has a greater power over the other? And now you can begin to understand why certain medicines work with some people and doesn't work with other people. Because you have to see what the person and the parts which are ill believe in and that is what they will respond to. The mother gives a very interesting example here. She says there is a great power in precise instructions given in a structure and sequence. Now for example, I don't remember the details of the way she formulated it but somebody was given, some lady was given this detailed instruction that Every morning she had to get up and do these things five times, then do those things five times and then do something else so many times and then go for a walk for so much time, stay in the sun for so long and there's a whole complicated routine she, would force, she was forced to do and the person got cured. And this kind of series of detailed instructions has an effect on the body of imprinting on the body a certain faith. Now where does it start? The mind believes and then the mind imprints on the life force and the life force imprints on the body and then you have the cure. But it's possible, remember the life energy flows between people easily. You can transmit a conviction of beliefs as under hypnosis. So somebody else may have a faith whose influence on you is strong enough and that will have an effect. So this is often the case when you see with uh, parents and children. The mother has the conviction which transmits into the child's body and the child receives those impressions and becomes now the faith in his or her body. And this is how very often you transmit diseases or illnesses or proclivity to certain illnesses, diabetes, is a habit in the body finally, a certain response to certain stimuli. What triggered that response? That habit now is passed on. You may say it's genetic. We will say it is a habit transmitted. The genes are only an imprint or carrier of the habit. You can override the habit at a psychological level and it will neutralize the gene. But how is this transmitted? Because child is a part of the mother, a part of the body separating but carrying a lot of the psychological substance and beliefs and impressions also and the faith particularly transmits. You'll see very often, those of you who are mothers, you hold the child who has a fever close to you, after a while the child recovers, goes and the imprint of the fever stays with you. Your body being bigger and stronger can of course get rid of it quickly. But you actually absorbed the illness of the child and gave the child your energy and immediately the problem was resolved. But the energy was not. The energy still needed to be worked out. You did it in your body. And this is quite common. 
It happens far more commonly than we believe. But the same thing could happen with somebody else, an adult, who could take even the burden of the energy or imprint his energy into you and a kind of an exchange takes place and then they work it out. This is quite common among certain types <coughs> of healers. But mostly they don't want to take it on themselves, they would rather push their conviction into you. It takes place in the form of a transmission of energy. I had my uh, first understanding, deeper understanding of acupressure through this. You know, they have a whole chart with all kinds of drawings, push this and it pushes that. It changes, it, it uh, activates these organs. Yes, of course, there's a truth to it. But I found the effective uh, acupressure people are not those who follow the chart. They are the ones who have the strong vital and the strong vital conviction. They squeeze you once and poof, you find yourself full of energy. It's not the point they pressed, it's the transmission of energy which took place and the conviction that was pushed in. And you're overwhelmed. So now uh, remove the charts, remove the pressure points and then you have what they call pranic healing or Reiki where you transmit life energy and the person gets a boost of life force, the normal body processes then work but the conviction also works through the life force. There's a danger though if you're not careful that you may receive the person's illness. If your energy is lower and the patient's energy is higher there may be an exchange. You give something good but you take the illness and then you don't know what to do with it. And this happens much more commonly than people realize, even with normal doctors, especially with psychiatrists. Because a normal doctor is interacting with you more at a material level, he's dealing with you as a body, but a psychiatrist is dealing with you as a, with a mind and with a heart. And he has to understand your feelings and your thoughts, which he cannot understand unless he connects with you and identifies on some deeper level. And the moment you identify, you are infected. The patient may receive your goodness, but you receive their confusion. And an exchange does take place. And this is the reason why they say very often psychiatrists themselves become <laughs> unbalanced. <laughs> unless, unless, they take, <laughs> unless they take great trouble. Unless they take great trouble to cleanse themselves. They have to cleanse themselves of those influences. And uh, if you ever go to a psychiatric ward, you will feel the vibes are weird. So weird you'll want to run away after a while. Because uh, that's how it is. But they have to cleanse themselves and it's never enough because you're living in that for so long. I, I'm sure Alok will have some interesting stories to <laughs> narrate of his own experiences in this matter. <laughs> yes. Alok had narrated an incident. Yes. Would you tell the story of mother curing Nishikanto? <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> uh, Alok had an interesting story. If, if you don't mind, I will share it. Uh, I heard it from you once. That he was working with a patient and he had this huge problem of the backwash from the patient's wives. And he happened to have mother's photograph. Well, he had mother's photograph on the table. He happened by in instinct to move the photo in between. And immediately he felt that connection cut. Is that correct? Am I narrating it correctly? Yeah, yeah. So uh, just bringing mother's picture in between. In fact, it's a method that the mother has uh, recommended. She said when you deal with people who have some emotional problems, somebody comes with great anger, the, you have to create a layer of protection. Because it's not the words they speak, it's the energy they throw at you. That's what creates the problem. You go away from there completely rattled, your nerves are shaking, your mind is confused. You are angry perhaps after that because you got infected by their anger. And they go away pleased, happy, they are relieved of their burden of anger. <laughs> they threw it on you and now you go and throw it on somebody else and then you feel relieved and he goes and throws on somebody else. It's not a nice thing. So she recommends putting consciously a wall of protection. You can do it by visualizing a wall or she says visualize her form her face, her form, and immediately it has a result, immediate. But these things are, work two ways. If you protect yourself, it's also harder to reach out help. And so it's necessary finally that you must be able to be in a different state of consciousness, develop a certain immunity to be able to help and so on. 
So I'm bringing now, I brought this to a domain which is almost entirely psychological. But I was coming to the importance of the faith, the conviction, which also is transmitted psychologically. When you go to a camp where they teach you to walk on fire, biologically, from the physics, chemistry and biology, you should get burnt when you walk on hot coals. Okay? But when you see people do it in a religious fervor, they have exceeded the laws of physics and chemistry and biology by the grace of God. And they walk on the fire carrying heavy load on their head. They don't get burnt. And now you go to a camp where they teach you to walk on fire. It could be next door. The guy will say, you know, there's no problem. This is all science. Believe in science. Forget God. There's a layer which forms of steam where a little bit of moisture evaporates from the contact of the coal and that creates an insulation layer. Therefore, you will not get burnt. Yes. Ah, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. I believe in science. And you walk on the coal and you're not burnt. What's the difference? You believed in this one, you believed in that one. It's the conviction you had. Okay? And the reality is that whole explanation does not does not apply, it doesn't work. But as long as you believed in science, it worked for you <laughs> because of your belief. I had a very interesting experience with this. It was uh, in Bangalore after a conference, they had these fire walkers. After the fire walkers went away, some of us in the audience, the young boys, they ran across the goals. I saw that. And then a few more ran and a few more ran. I said, my God, this was my opportunity. Once in a lifetime occasion, I won't do it again. But if I don't do it now, I'll have missed an opportunity. I have to do it. So I went to the edge of this fire pit. The heat is so great, it's burning on your face. The skin is, uh, feels burning. And I stand there and I can't move. My body won't move. The only way I could get it to move, I pulled my awareness here. I had to forget the body, forget everything. Just hold that conviction. It works. And then my body moved, I walked across, came on the other side, where's the burn, where's the burn, I don't feel any burn, there should be a burn. And my mind is going to the feet, trying to feel the surface, where's the burn. And then it found one point which was itching, ah, there is the burn. And then it spread a little bit and had a bit of a reddish, not burn, but a reddish mark, some slight scalding. But it's like the mind wanted to find it and it of course it found it. But mostly there was nothing else. It was interesting to see the body would not move unless, until the conviction came that it would not be burnt. And this is the, the truth of so much of the healing that takes place in us. In the conviction and faith that we spoke of, remember it is a part in you that knows already, that knows health. Okay? So now how are we going to use it in practice? When you are sick, Observe where you feel the sickness. Which part of you is enjoying the sickness? And there's always a part that's enjoying it. If it was not enjoying it, the sickness couldn't stay for long. There's a part that says, Oh, poor me, I'm so sick, I'm so unwell. And it tells people, you know what, I'm so unwell. And it enjoys telling people and getting that sympathy and attention. <laughs> I like the fact that I'm lying down in my bed and my mother brings me something warm to drink, I feel pampered and it's so nice. I get to eat special meals and she says, oh, you poor fellow, <laughs> yeah, me, poor me. <laughs> so something is enjoying it. So find the part in you that's enjoying it. And then separate from these and look for the part in you that knows your well. Find that part where you have the conviction of your own health and of your own immunity to the illness and shift your attention more in that and then from that part extend that immunity that conviction the faith of immunity into the other parts until it overwhelms the other parts very interesting descriptions in Sri Aurobindo's uh, record of yoga these were daily diary notes that he maintained of his own journey on the yoga and it's uh, very revealing but very cryptic, so we don't always understand everything fully. But there he uses this faith, shraddha, this word shraddha, 
and the contrary faith which is ashraddha and he describes how repeatedly there are these periods where the shraddha gets stronger and then there is the resurgence of the ashraddha pushing back the shraddha it's as if within us there are parts which have the conviction of health and immunity and parts which have accepted illness and you have to and this is part of the process of the yoga to spread the conviction and shraddha into all those parts until all of us is entirely filled with that faith shraddha of immunity and to the extent that this happens we actually become immune even to extents which you would find unimaginable there's an example which is given in a book uh, that is called uh, i don't remember the name now where uh, a japanese martial arts master demonstrates his capacity he takes a sword and the sword is so sharp a piece of wood and the sword just goes shack cuts through then he concentrates on his arm and when he is ready he points and the assistant takes the same sword and hits his arm it bounces only a slight welt of the impact is there no cut amazing isn't it and then after that he has to concentrate and release that focus there are people similarly who walk on sword blades climb steps and they are not cut you try to do it and you are most likely going to get cut unless you have been trained in their system which means really imprinting the conviction the shraddha and building on it you see how far this can go there's a whole system of training now which is built on this principle uh, in the military when they are taught to shoot with a gun shoot a target at a great distance you aim you know you won't make it you're not an expert you're not a marksman you shoot of course you're off the center by quite a bit and over weeks and months and years you improve slightly each time you improve you get a little more confidence and a little more confidence until eventually you can become a pretty good marksman you see what's the secret here it's still the faith so in this new approach to training they do the reverse they start with a target that's exactly 1 meter away you lift the gun you can't miss it you have to be totally dumb to miss it right you shoot you hit success they move the target 10 cm behind you shoot you hit success push it 10 cm behind within a week you are shooting at 100 meters with perfect accuracy why because you went from faith to greater faith not starting with ashraddha but starting with shraddha conviction in the body swami vivekananda it is narrated was when he was visiting the us they went to some fair and there were these balloons i uh, know it was ducks there were these uh, wooden ducks and you had to shoot them in the water and uh, swami vivekananda observed that and he laughed so they said oh why are you laughing uh, do you think you're better than us you do it so they gave him the gun and he shot every one of them in a row not one miss they're surprised they said my god you must have been an expert marksman you must have trained a lot he said no it's the first time i've picked up a gun <laughs> <laughs> and you see where this comes from it comes from a person in whom that shraddha has been deeply imprinted the body knows it's capable of doing whatever is demanded of it as an instrument of the divine will so now we come to the other side of the key the force which acts through the instrument through the instrumentation which uses the faith the shraddha as its base for action what's the nature of this force you see there are many forces there's the physical force i push force of physics how many newtons of pressure it is there's the life force vital energy which you pump through pranic healing or others there's a mind force also but the spiritual force is of a different order altogether it is the force emerging from a consciousness which is essentially undivided and indivisible 
Its origin is in the self, outside space-time, entering space-time, entering into domain of form, it acts. This is the highest spiritual force. We can have any intermediate gradations of spiritual force, but still, as long as it's above mind, we call it spiritual, because it still knows the oneness behind it. So the nature of this force, because it is based on the consciousness of oneness, it acts in a, from a consciousness of oneness, it acts on many things at the same time in a single harmonized action. It can act equally on the mind, on the life energy and on the body with as much ease, the higher it is, the more effective it is. And so when it acts, it is able to bring things under its law, its principle, its influence. And if you look at all illness, it is essentially a disharmony in functioning between parts. When a force comes which is a power of harmony, which can pull things together into harmony, obviously it can have direct miraculous outcomes and results. As long as the material on which it acts accepts, accepts the force and accepts to be responsive to it. So the mother explains, Ashri Aurobindo explains this, when you put yourself in the hands of the Divine Mother and ask her to mold you, three things are required. Consciousness, plasticity, surrender. If that part is not conscious, its response, its receptivity will not be so strong. So the more conscious you are, the more you can be receptive. Second, plasticity, it must be responsive to the pressure. If you push on stone, the stone does not give way, well, you can't do much with it. But if you push on something plastic, it yields, then you can shape it as you want. So the divine force acting in you can shape your substance to heal, to correct any distortion and set right any problem, if you have the plasticity. And third is surrender, that you give yourself, put yourself in her hands and say, I give myself to you, I yield, I invoke you, but I also yield. Then only that action can be complete. These are the three requirements. Now if you dwell on these three, in the mind, you can see how it would work in the life energies and even in the body. If you have done regular asanas, if you have developed your body consciousness, the consciousness of the body being awake, it can be much more responsive to the force. Otherwise the force has to work against your own inertia and unconsciousness, increase the consciousness, it takes a little longer. In the mind, of course, we are more conscious so we can be much more responsive to the action of the force. But the force will come in response to your call. Its effectivity will be in proportion to your consciousness, plasticity and surrender, your receptivity. And the faith within you, the conviction of what's possible. And so it's the alignment of these two things finally, which is the decisive cure. Everything else are layers of modifiers, gradations of influence. And that's why the mother gave a message, I think it was for the ashram nursing home, ultimately it is the faith that cures. Of course our doctors put it up prominently on the wall and then forget all about it. <laughs> but the wording is very uh, precise, ultimately it is the faith that cures. Behind it, and there's so many layers of processes, but ultimately it is the faith which is going to have that. The example which Narad wanted me to share, now uh, it becomes appropriate. This is the example of Nishikanto who was so sick, he was about to die. And as his dying wish, he insisted to be brought to the mother. And then told the mother, please place your feet on my chest. And when he insisted for a long time, she accepted, she put her foot on his chest. And he had a complete cure. And for the rest of his life, he went on telling people this story. Imagine one foot of the mother on my chest and I was completely cured. Imagine what would happen if she put both her feet. <laughs> <laughs> but that was physically done. What can happen equally without the physical contact? 
So this is, a, I thought, a useful broad perspective of uh, the whole domain. There are many more interesting dimensions to it, but maybe we can just see what comes up in questions, if you have any. Is there anything like unrealistic shraddha or they don't go, go together? Okay, it's a very important question. Unrealistic faith, unrealistic shraddha. You know, there are books out there. I remember reading one of them uh, by the author of Jonathan Livingston Siegel, where he says, if you truly believe something, it becomes real. You truly believe you'll walk on water and you can walk on water. Mm -hmm. I tried it, it did work. <laughs> I'm sure many people tried it. <laughs> you truly believe you can fly, you will fly. The error is, which part of you believes that? When you say you will truly believe, it's your mind's conviction. It's not your body's conviction. You understand the difference? So it's when you say unrealistic, for whom? For which part? For the body perhaps, but for the mind it's not unrealistic. And if the mind believes it, the mind can have that experience. But the life energies, they don't really... If you can bring that Shraddha all the way into the body consciousness, then you will get some remarkable results. Like you saw the person who, who would not be cut, he developed immunity to injury, and similar results could be possible. But that takes a long effort to bring that conviction into the body consciousness. Sri Aurobindo had some remarkable uh, results from his work on the body consciousness. He said he could walk on burning floor where in the noon heat, even the tar was melting in Pondicherry roads. And he said he could walk on that and feel only a cooling sensation and no sensation of uh, discomfort of heat. But the body had to be brought to that stage of uh, conviction. <coughs>